Moving? Yeah. Alrighty. Alrighty, so for an introduction text, we're going to open up our Bibles to the book of uh, 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy, that's page number page number 1583. 1583. 1 Timothy. Now, a lot of us were familiar with this verse. We go through this time and time again. Um, but this topic just never gets old. I, I believe one of the topics that the Lord laid on my heart just from starting off preaching is you need to preach about the end times. You need to preach about prophecy. You know, you need to, and, and sometimes you get carried away with that. I'm trying to find a balance on, pra, you know, practicality in the Christian life. But the heavy burden that I think the Lord wants a lot of preachers to emphasize in these last days is preaching on, on doctrine and preaching on the end times because that's the times that we're living in. Real quick, if you look at this chart right here, this, this chart, this whole, this is called a dispensational chart, okay? This whole chart right here lays out the Bible. There's no other book in this entire universe. I don't care if you had the whole million books in the Library of Congress. This book triumphs. That's why I like that poster right there, the Holy Bible on the mountain. You see all, that, you see all these books over here? You see all these books? There, there's philosophy books in here. There's uh, other knockoff Bibles, phony Bibles. One of the main accusations against the Bible is, well, it's corrupted. Yeah, of course, there's all kinds of corruption. If you come over here, there's all kinds of, there's over 450 English translations. They're all corrupt. They're all satanic. They're all perverted. They're, they all come from the Vatican. They all, they're all, the Catholic Church, they, they switch things out. They change things out. But God's obligated. He promised to preserve a book. Heaven and earth shall pass away. My words shall not pass away. You know who said that? Jesus Christ said that. So it's either Jesus Christ is a liar or we have his words. We have every single word of God in here. This book triumphs over every single book out there. It tells us how we got here. In matter of fact, you try, you, you try to find and copy a book that gets 40 different authors over the course of 4,000 years or 2,000 years when they really wrote it over three different continents all corresponding with one message without no contradiction, without any discrepancies. You know what the main theme about this whole giant book is? The Holy Bible of God? The main theme is about Jesus Christ. God of the universe who created the universe, flung this thing out of, out of nothing, spoke the worlds into existence, came down 2,000 years ago in the, in the fashion of a man. Jesus Christ is God Almighty. That's something we've got to keep in mind. The Bible tells us how we got here, Adam and Eve, true knowledge of good and evil. Next thing you know, Noah shows up, Noah's Ark. God floods the world. Next thing you know, Nimrod shows up, they try building a tower to reach into the heavens. Okay, that's your one world government back in the day. History is going to repeat itself and happen again. Then you got Abraham, God calls out a certain people, the Jewish people. Next thing you know, you got Moses. People are usually familiar with Moses, part of the Red Sea, did all those miracles in Egypt and stuff. And uh, God called out his people, his Jewish people, that were in slavery in Egypt for 430 years. He called them people out. And, and, uh, and God chose a people, the Jewish people. That's a, that's a blessing. And he got them under the law, the moral, the moral code, the law. That's another thing, morality, ethics. You ain't going to find nothing no, no it's, that's moral. There's a holy, righteous law inside of this book. That's another thing. And other religions out there and stuff, they're, they're immoral. There's no boundaries. There's no morals. It's, uh, you know, just do, kind of do whatever you want type of thing. There's a standard of righteousness. A standard of judgment. Okay, God gets them under the law, 613 commandments. Next thing you know, what is that? Two, over 2,000 years later, close to 2,000 years from Moses, John the Baptist shows up. John the Baptist baptizes the Lord Jesus Christ and, and announces to the nation of Israel, this is the Messiah. This is the Savior, Jesus Christ. Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. Next thing you know, Jesus Christ dies on the cross. He died on the cross, 1 Corinthians 15. He died for what? Why in the world? Name me. Here's the thing. Jesus Christ died for our sins. Name me one sinner Jesus Christ died for. <laughs> he died for me. <laughs> he died for me. He died for everybody in the world. If you believe in him, receive him. God gives out a free gift. It's, it's, it's based on you. If you trust that free gift and take it, God, Jesus Christ, he died for our sins. He was buried. He resurrected the third day according to the scriptures. That's salvation. Salvation is all about what God did for you. All those other religions out there, pick any other one under the book. Buddha, well, he told me to meditate underneath of a tree for, for 15 hours or whatever. I might achieve nirvana and enlightenment. 
What do you mean? That, what, what did that God do for me? Pick, look at Allah and the, and the God of Muslims. They never, that God, Allah, he never even revealed himself. Some mysterious figure. Look at the God of Hindu, all these gods of Hinduism and these deities and these elephants and hybrids. What did that thing ever do for me? Never done nothing for me. My God came down 2,000 years ago, took my place on the cross, took away my sins, nailing them to the cross. He died for my sins, was buried, rose again the third day. There's no other salvation out there. That's salvation. People get mixed up with salvation in religion. Religion is all about a set of works. Well, what could you do for God? Salvation is about what did God do for you? That's a blessing. Jesus Christ died for my sins. He was buried. He rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. Next thing you know, we're in this time period of church age. We're right here. We're at the very end of this thing. This thing's about to pop off. It's about to get crazy. Next thing you know, we're in a, uh, next, a big climatic event that happens on God's calendar is the catching away. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, every person sitting here that believes that Jesus Christ died for my sins, he was buried, he rose again the third day, is going to be caught out of this world in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. This leads me to the topic, uh, the title of tonight's topic, which is the dangers of New Age theology in UFOs in the Bible. That's what we're going to be talking about tonight. The dangers of New Age theology in UFOs in the Bible. Next thing you know, we're going to get caught up in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. You say what you want about that. That sounds like an abduction. <laughs> One Sunday, we're sitting here in this little room, not only in this little room, every Christian in the world. You talk about an economic collapse. You talk about the whole world just, where these people, where they just go? Vanish in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. We get caught up to the judgment seat of Christ. Jesus Christ is going to judge our service. That's why I, I, I emphasize during the preaching a lot. Once I get saved, once I truly understand the grace of God, we sung about the grace of God, amazing grace, you know, amazing grace. What's grace? Grace is God, God giving you something that you didn't deserve. Because listen, everybody broke the law. I broke the law, you broke the law, you broke the law, he broke the, everybody. The Bible says, for all have sinned. In grace is God granting a sinner like me. He's granting a sinner the, the, uh, to, to give me his perfect record and to take my dirty, filthy record and put it on him. He died for my sins. Okay, so that's, that's something about grace. God gives me grace. We go up in the judgment seat of Christ. We're tried for our service. What did we do for the Lord? Once we did, after we got saved. Next thing you know, the time of Jacob's trouble shows up. It's a seven-year period. The Antichrist was going to rule the world. The devil comes down from outer space. He's going to set up a one-world government, one-world currency system, all that. Next thing you got over here, what's after this? The second coming. You got Jesus Christ coming back from heaven, coming back from glory. On earth as it is in heaven, he's going to set up the kingdom of heaven on earth. Right now, the kingdom of heaven ain't here. <laughs> this thing is the kingdom of hell. The, the devil's ruling the world right now. One day, Jesus Christ is going to come back and set up his thousand-year reign. He's going to—he's going to show you. Look, you guys thought you could roll. You guys thought you could fix this and roll the world and fix the environment and fix this problem and you know everybody all help the poor people and and help all this. Jesus Christ says, "I'm going to come back. I'm going to fix it. I'm going to show you how to run the world." <laughs> he does it for a thousand years. Okay, the thousand-year reign of Christ. You talk about peace. People want to talk about this peace and love and joy and this this state of utopia. You can't get none of that. Unless if Jesus Christ is rolling and reigning on a throne. You know what they call Jesus Christ? The, the Prince of Peace. The Prince of Peace. There's all kinds of fake pieces out there. Facades. Okay, we're going to get into some of that stuff. And then the great white throne judgment. Then, Jesus Christ, then God at the end of the Bible says, Behold, I make new heavens and new earth. So what we're talking about tonight is the danger of new age theology in UFOs in the Bible. Okay? Now real quick, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go through some verses. Let's look in the book of Jude. Let's look in the book of Jude. Good evening, Shelley. Good to see you tonight. Amen. We're going to open up our Bible to the book of Jude. A little book right before the book of Revelation. I'll give you a page number. Jude chapter 1, verse 19. Jude chapter 1, verse 19. Well, close. How about, how about Jude chapter 1, verse, uh, that's page 1641. Let's see here. How about Jude chapter 1, verse 9? Jude chapter 1, verse 9. Jude chapter 1, verse 9. Now, what I'm, what I'm going to talk about real quick is we're going to go over classifications of other beings in the Bible. Okay? Other beings in the Bible. The whole world, you know, praise the Lord. There's something unique about mankind. You know what's unique about mankind? We are made in the image of God. We have a body, a soul, and a spirit. 
We're a triparty nature, tri triune being. Everybody heard of the Father, Son, Holy Ghost. God is a triune is a triune being. All right, three parts to one God. That's the same with man. Okay, well, body, soul, and spirit. There's other classifications of beings in the Bible. Number one is an archangel. All right, so look at Jude chapter one verse nine. Yet Michael, the archangel, page sixteen forty two, Jude one nine. Yet Michael, the archangel. When contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses. Durst not bring a railing, uh, durst not bring against him a railing accusation, but said, "The Lord rebuke thee." I don't got time to expound that passage, but Moses, or, but it says right there, Michael, the archangel. There's only one archangel mentioned in the Bible. That's Michael. There's not Raphael and Seraphim and the five Ninja Turtles or whatever they call them. There's one archangel in the Bible. It's Michael. Gabriel's an angel, no doubt. He's a messenger. But Michael, the archangel. Okay, that's one. All right, now we, we, we got that down. Michael, the archangel. Uh, he shows up, and notice him, though, when he's contending with the devil. And if you want a little bit of nugget and stuff, you better watch out when you're, you, you know, you're treading on the ground and, you know, I'm, I'm better than the devil. The devil don't got nothing. He ain't touching me and all that. Uh, you got to be careful with that. If the devil's ever troubling you in your life, the best thing to say is the Lord rebuke thee. I can't rebuke the devil. He'll, I, I'm reading the book of Job. If you've seen the devil appear right now, I'd fall, fall flat on my back. I'd die. You can't, you got to take the, the Lord got to deal with the devil. The Lord rebuke thee, okay? That's one. Look at Revelation chapter, uh, well, we're going to go there. We're going to go there in a, in a minute. But look at Hebrews 13. Let's go to another one. Let's go to another classification of beings. So you got an archangel, okay? We're going to see there's a bit of a hierarchy when it comes to you know, we're studying a little bit of angelology. All that means is a fancy way of saying the knowledge of angels. And if you want to know a thing or two about angels, you've got to go and open up God's book and see what the Bible got to say about angels. Look at Hebrews 13. Look at Hebrews chapter 13. I'll give you a page number. That's page 1615. 1615. Hebrews chapter 13. Now, we'll talk about angels. So, obviously, an archangel is above the standard angels. Okay, now what's what is it, what's an angel really? Look at Hebrews chapter thirteen, verse number two. Hebrews thirteen, verse number two. It says, "Be not forgetful to entertain strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares." Some have entertained. That word entertain, you know, people think, you know, come to my house, I'll entertain you. I'll get out the chips and salsa and we'll put on a movie on a TV or whatever. And a little, little, little entertainment get together or something. But entertain, now if you read the Bible, angels showed up to people. Now, I want you to no notice that though. Angels unawares. Do we all see that word there? Hebrews 13, verse number two. Some have entertained angels unawares. You know what that's saying? That's saying they were unaware that that thing was even an angel. <laughs> Imagine that. People think right away automatically because you're conditioned by artwork and images. That's why, that's why there's no pictures in this Bible. That's why God gave us a black and white book. No pictures. No, this ain't a coloring book. This ain't no, you know, little peanuts and crackers or Charlie Brown coloring book or nothing. God didn't want us to set up images. That's why you see all these images of Jesus and all this. And get away from them images. If you want to know something about the things of God, you go to his book. Okay, now angels, <laughs> you want to get you want to get flabbergasted. Angels don't have wings. Let <laughs> me repeat that in the Bible. Angels don't got wings. They appear like a man. <laughs> angels unaware. You know, an angel knock on your door. You don't even know the thing's an angel. Now I don't got time to run the references. Abraham seen angels. Okay, what they do? They the angels ate. They fed. They baked them cakes. He sat down in their house and stuff. Sodom and Gomorrah. God rained down fire and brimstone on a city. Because that city was rebellious. God forbid, man. We're, God shed grace on America. He don't rain fire and brimstone down on us. But man, those angels came into Sodom and Gomorrah. They didn't know they were angels. How, how could you be an angel unaware if you got seven foot wings sticking out the side of your back? You would know, well, I, I'm not inviting that thing into my house. I'm a little bit weary. But angels in the Bible, every time you come across that word angel in the Bible, it's in a reference to a man. It's a male. That's another thing. You ain't gonna find even a female angel. I don't know. Don't don't come at me. That's that's just how it is. There's no female angels. There's male angels, and they don't got wings, and they look like regular human beings. They look like people. That's pretty interesting. Now we'll look at another one. Look at cherubim, another classification of beings in the Bible. 
Let's look into oh, let's look at Old Testament Ezekiel. Let's see here. Ezekiel chapter number Ezekiel chapter number one. That's page 1068. 1068. 1068. 1068. All right, this is this is 1068. Now you want to talk about UFO? This thing is an unidentified flying object. Now the reason why we're talking about this subject tonight is because, like I said, this is a very relevant topic. And the, and the reason why is one of the, um, we didn't even read our introduction text in 1 Timothy chapter 4. <laughs> the Bible says in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse number 1, I'll just quote it. Uh, For in the latter times, some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits in doctrines of devils. 1 Timothy chapter 1, 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. In the latter times, that's where we're living, some shall depart from the faith. Yeah, I was raised Christian. Yeah, I went to church. Yeah, I heard about Jesus Christ. Yeah, I don't want nothing to do with him no more, though. You know, they're going to depart from the faith. This, this was foretold. One, people that were, said they were Christians at one point in time, they're not going to be Christians no more. Well, why? Well, what, what's going to happen? Giving heed to seducing spirits in doctrines of devils. Giving heed, meaning they pay attention to the wrong stuff. Giving heed pay, in, to seducing spirits, something seductive. If you know a thing or two about the devil, he's a seductive being, a serpent, something that's sly, something that may sound good, may look good, but is wickedness at the end, seductive. You've got to watch out for that. Seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. So one of the things that's going to knock off a child of God in the latter days is New Age theology and some of this UFO talk. If we don't, if we don't get the right perspective, listen, if I want to know a thing or two, anything in this entire world, I want to. I want to. I want to see it God's way, because my, my way could be flawed. I'm a sinner. I got flaws all left and right. I want to. I want to conform my mind, my thoughts to how God sees a thing. So when the world talks about UFOs and stuff, I better see. Okay, Lord, tell me what. What are these? Give me the truth about these UFOs and stuff first, so that I know how to discern the times that I'm living in, so where I could say it's true or false. Okay, that's why God gave us an absolute standard of judgment and authority and truth. So look at this UFO here in Ezekiel chapter 1. Look at verse number. Let's look at verse number 4. Ezekiel, he's saying this. I looked, he's at the river of, he's at the river of Chebar, okay? He's sitting at a river. Next thing you know, look at verse number 4. And I looked, and behold, a whirlwind came out of the north, a great cloud, and a fire enfolding itself. That's wild. A cloud, fire enfolding itself, and a brightness was about it, a brightness. This is before electricity, let me remind you. And out of the midst thereof, as the color of amber, out of the midst of fire, of the amber, that's like a, you know, amber color. Also, out of the midst thereof came, look at this, the likeness of four living creatures. And this was their appearance. He's going to tell us. They had the likeness of a man, and everyone had four faces, and everyone had four wings. Now people say, ah, oh, there you go. Angel got wings. That, this is a cherubim. There's a difference. There's a difference of a cherubim and an angel. There's a, it, when I read my Bible, I only find five cherubs in the Bible. Cherubim. And we're going to get getting that in a minute. Their feet, look at this. This is describing these, these creatures. Their feet were straight feet. And the sole of their feet was like the sole of a calf's foot. That's pretty interesting. And they sparkled like the color of burnished brass. They had a glow about them. And they had, hand, they had the hands of a man under their wings on their four sides. Therefore, had faces in, in, in their wings. Their wings would join one to another. And look at verse number 10. As for the likeness of their faces, they four had the face of. Now, this is wild because they have a, a face of four different creatures. <laughs> I mean, it, you, people you talk about two face and stuff. This thing had four different faces. All right, look at this. The, the, they, had one had, uh, they had the face of a man, the face of a lion, the face of an ox on the left side. They four also had the face of an eagle. So right there, you see these creatures have a face of a lion, a man, a lion, an ox, and an eagle. Now, let's pause and let's think about this. The man, that represents the humanity, general mankind. The lion will represent wildlife. You think a king in the jungle, king of the wildlife, there's your lion. Okay, you got a, you got a, uh, what was the other one? An ox. An ox would represent a domesticated, domesticated classification of animals. 
let me ask you a question. Who was created first, the cherubim or mankind? And cherubim. Ain't that something? The, the cherubim almost foreshadowed or predated man. You know, that's, a little, that's some, some wild stuff. So what I'm getting at is the man would, would, would foreshadow something of mankind. The lion would foreshadow God's creation of wildlife. The ox would represent God's uh, foreshadowing of domesticated animals. Then you got the eagle would foreshadow God's aerodynamic creatures that he created. What classification of life is missing? The aquatic reptilian class. <laughs> where's, the old, where's that old serpent? Where's that old devil at? So there's a class that's missing. That's why we're going to get into this UFO talk when we talk about the reptilians. <laughs> right, it's going to get a little wild tonight. The devil in the Bible is that old serpent. The, the, devil's all, he's, he, the devil has an association, Leviathan. He has an association with water and reptiles. It's pretty, pretty weird. And he was the anointed cherub that covereth. There's five cherubs in the Bible, and guess what? The devil was one of them. People say the devil was a fallen angel. Don't ever say that. He was a fallen cherubim. Now, that's wild, because to this day, right now, as I'm speaking, there's four other cherubim. Them four cherubim right there are still surrounding the throne of God, saying, holy, 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 praise the Lord. They're up there praising God. And that devil, that one, that, the one that covered the throne, he fell. All right? So you got cherubim. Um, let's look at Isaiah 14. While we're on this topic, Isaiah 14. Isaiah 14. That's page number 931. 931. All right, here's another classification. Isaiah 931. Oh, I'm sorry, uh, page 931. Page 931, look at this. Isaiah chapter 14, verse number 12. Isaiah 14, that would be on the, left, on the right page, Isaiah 14, verse 12. Now look at this. You're going to see Isaiah chapter 14, verse 12, 13, 14, and 15. You're going to see these verses are going to talk about the fall of Lucifer. Okay? Look at Isaiah 14, verse 12. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground which did weakest the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, you want to talk about the original sin in mankind, the original sin. People, the Catholic Church would call it adultery, the original sin. The original sin in the Bible is pride. This thing is what got the devil messed up. Look at verse 13. For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. Okay? I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. As a classic passage, they call it the five I wills. I will, I will, I will, I will, I will do this. I'm going to, I'm going to be, the devil is going to, he's trying to say, I'm going to be like God. Now look at verse 15. I was like, I was like God's rebuke at this. Okay, God always got the last word. <laughs> Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell, to the sides of the pit. <laughs> you ain't got nothing on me. <laughs> That's what I love about God. He, the devil said, you, you want to speak your heart? Iniquity was found in the devil. He went, he was lifted up with pride. Thought he could get, thought he could get over top of God. Now, real quick about that, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. We're going to get into a little study on stars. A lot of times, stars in the Bible are representations of angels. Now, if I, if I had to say who's, who's powerful, Michael the archangel or the, or the devil, i got to go with Michael the archangel. Because somehow, someway, in the book of Revelation chapter 12, he, the, the, the Michael the archangel fought against the dragon and his angels, and, and Michael prevailed against the devil. The, the, Michael defeats the devil, and it, the devil gets cast down to planet Earth. People think about the devil. The, the, when they think of the devil, they think of this guy with some pitchfork and, and big horn and just you know red and, and big muscular and you know he's just, the devil manifests himself as an angel of light. Look at first. Look at look at Second uh, Corinthians. Look at this. This is what, what's wild about this. Look at Second Corinthians or yeah Second Corinthians. Chapter 11. I'll give you a page number. That's page number 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Look at verse number 14 or 13. That's page 1541. 1541. Right now we're talking about the being. The, we're talking about other beings. And we're talking about the devil. All right. He, the devil, he, he, uh, he was Lucifer. He, he, he rebelled. He, he had pride. He got lifted up. 
Now look at this. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Look at verse 13, page 1541. The Apostle Paul's right, and he says, For such are false apostles. So there's false apostles, deceitful workers. Now look at this word, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. Transforming. I don't want to jump ahead at all and stuff like that, but when we talk about these UFOs, we're going to look at it. When you talk about in this UFO stuff, they're shapeshifters. They're shape-shifting beings. People are going to say, this is insane. This is wild. Well, we're, we're going to get it. We're going to see some of this stuff. Now, look at verse 14. You want to talk about a shape-shifter. Look at verse 14. And no marvel, I mean, don't be surprised, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. He's transformed. Well, one, 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 time, one passage says he's like a serpent. Next passage I read, he's like Leviathan. Next passage I read, he's the anointed cherub. Another passage I read, he transforms into an angel of light. Now, if you know, if we know about angels, an angel is a man. So the devil can appear like an angel of light. Now look at verse 15. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers be transformed as the ministers of righteousness. I don't know. Do we got a bunch of shape-shifting weird people over there in the Vatican Church or something like that? A bunch of reptilians? Generation of vipers. <laughs> Generation of vipers. Why would the Lord say something like that? Before I go off, I am ain't teaching this doctrinally. This is a little bit of speculation. But Jesus Christ called a whole group of people a generation of vipers. You originate from a snake. That's pretty weird stuff. Now, look at, um, let's, look at, let's look at Isaiah 6, verse 2. Isaiah 6, verse 2. Isaiah chapter 6, verse 2. That's uh, page 921. All right, the next classification of beings in the Bible, you got your seraphim. You say, ah, well, they're the same. They're all the same. They're all an angel. No, no. There are certain words in the Bible that, that are different. You've got to rightly divide. All right, now look at this. Look at page 921, Isaiah chapter 6. Look at verse number 2. Isaiah chapter 6, verse number 2. And it stood the seraphims. Each one had six wings. Now, ain't that something? Each of these things had six wings. The cherubim had four wings. So right away, there's a difference. Now, seraphims, there's at least two of them. We don't know how many, but it's plural, so there must be more than one. So seraphims, each had six wings. With twain, he covered his face. So two, he covered his faith, face, and with twain, he did cover his feet, and with twain, he did fly. And he cried, holy, holy is the, is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Now, that's one thing. I think that word seraphim shows up, I think, one time. Seraphims. They got six wings. All right. Um, let's look at another one. Let's look at, let's look at Genesis chapter 6, another classification of beings in the Bible. All right. Look at Genesis chapter 6. That's page 14. Derek Taylor, we're talking about the dangers of New Age theology, and we're talking about UFOs in the Bible. All right, and UFOs in the Bible and the dangers of New Age theology. Because I'm gonna, we're gonna get to that New Age stuff in a minute. I'm just going over classifications of other beings in, in the Bible. So Genesis chapter six, look at verse number two. Now look at this: the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair. And they took them wives, all which they chose. Now, there's a group of people in the Bible called sons of God. These are all. Now, look at this, though. Genesis chapter 6, verse 2. Sons of God. There's only one, the only begotten son of God. That's a big deal. You got them other new, new versions and new knockoff Bibles and stuff? They changed the most famous verse, John 3, 16. Uh, the, one, the one and only son. What do you mean one and only son? God, this says right there, sons of God. As a matter of fact, it says if you, if you receive Jesus Christ, to them gave you power to become the sons of God. There's, not, there's only one begotten, the Son of God. That's God Almighty, God manifested in the flesh, Jesus Christ. Now, these were sons of God, saw daughters of men that were fair. They took wives of all which they chose. Next thing you know, come down to verse number four. And there were giants in the earth in those days and also after that. This is before the flood. When the sons of God 
came into the daughters of men, and they bare children to them. The same became mighty men which were of old, men of renown. People worshipped these giants. Now, that's why I like this chart here, because all the Bible, you know, right now, them sons of God came down before the days of Noah. Came down. That's why God flooded the world. One of the big things. And Noah was perfect in his generations. Now, you had a, a commandment. I'm gonna, let's look at something real quick. Look at Job chapter 1. These sons of God rebelled. Now, we don't know how many of them came down. And, and somehow, some way, they, they, they produced a hybridized being, a giant. It's a mixture of, a, of a sons of God. These fallen beings came into the daughters of men, and they produced this offspring. Okay. Now, look at Job. Look at Job chapter 38. Job chapter 38, page 767, 767, Job chapter 38, verse 7. Uh, Job 38, Job 38, look at this, Job 38, verse 7. Now, see this here, Job 38, 7, page 765. Now, look at this, Job chapter 38, verse 7. Now, we'll back it up to verse 6 for some context. Now, this is God talking to Job. Now, he's, he asked Job, Whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened? Or who laid the cornerstone thereof? Now, what you see in the book of Job, real quick, for a quick synopsis, is, is God's boasting. Job thinks he's self-righteous. He thinks he got it all figured out. And God says, No, you don't. Who laid the foundations of the earth? Were you there, Were you there and, and seen all this happen? And God gets into some deep stuff, and Job shuts his mouth. He has no reply back to God. But look at verse 7. So this goes back into creation. When the foundations are ever fastened, look at verse 7. When the morning stars sang together, and all the sons of God shouted for joy. I read this today on my lunch break and, and, and sat back thinking, man, the sons of God, they shouted together. They seen God Almighty create the entire, the, the spoke, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. And then there's a lot of stuff that happened between Genesis 1-1 and Genesis 1-2, that intermediate period there. <laughs> oh, it's a whole other thing. But they seen, they, sung, they, 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 they shouted for joy. And you look at the devil, I believe they sang. And you know the thing or two about the, in Ezekiel 28? There was pipes and, and musical instruments. The devil, the Lucifer was like a musical instrument. He was probably leading that choir. I mean, what a scene. The next thing you know, Genesis them same sons of God came down into the daughters of men. We read a verse on, on uh, in, uh, last Sunday. The angels, which kept not their first estate, their habitation, they came down to planet Earth and, and, and intermingled. That, that, that really stuck out, that stuck out to me. I was thinking, man, what a scene. They shot it for joy. Next thing you know, who knows how long it was, they, they disobeyed God. Now let's look at another, let's look at another group of people, in, beings in the Bible. Look at... Um, Let's look at Daniel 2.43. I got a couple other here, but I got I to gotta pick up the pace here. Daniel chapter 2. That's page number. Daniel chapter 2 verse. Let's see here. Daniel chapter 2. I'm on verse 40. That's page 1140. We're going to look at another group of beings. Another group of beings in the Bible. And I don't know what to call these people, but iron men. You look at Marvel, you got that whole thing, you know, Iron Man, he's a, he's a guy, next to you, but, you know, Tony Stark, he's a half-suit guy, and he, he's a smart guy, but he builds his suit and stuff. Well, somehow, some way, we're going to look at this intermingling of iron and clay. Where it came from clay. I'm a ball of dust. God created for me and breathed in Adam's nostrils. So you got clay. Now look at this verse in Daniel chapter 2, verse 43. Daniel 2, 43, 11, 40. And whereas thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay. Now, what's this? They shall mingle themselves. They, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. But they shall not cleave one to another. Meaning, you, this, ain't, this ain't natural. Even as iron is not mixed with clay. It's not natural. You don't see a guy walking down the road and he's a half cyborg. <laughs> You're going to say, what's up with that? that? That don't mix. That don't cleave together. Okay? Now, we're in a day and age where, you, where we, this is a movement called transhumanism. And what that means is they're trying to, 
to, to combine AI artificial intelligence in cyborgs and to make you you want to run fast? You want to be like an athlete? You know, you want to be able to slam dunk? I do. <laughs> I'd like to slam dunk, you know. I mean, I, I trained for se seven months. I can only dunk on a nine-foot, seven-inch rim. <laughs> but anyway, um, I'd like to be able to do all that, and that appeals to people. So they're going to get into this thing about this mixing this iron and clay. They call it transhumanism. That stuff is, is some weird, wicked stuff there, okay? God put boundaries and limits on human beings for a reason. This gets into some far stuff about people trying to take your consciousness and download it onto this little chip right here so then I can plug it into my cute computer and relive my memories. Yeah, what happens you get stuck in that computer and you're living in an infinite loop or something like that? <laughs> I don't want nothing to do with all that stuff. This, this crazy AI artificial intelligence stuff. One of the big men behind that is Elon Musk, richest man in the world. Now look at Ephesians chapter 6 here. I'm going to look at more beings in the Bible. Iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. I call them, those would be your iron men. So there's, there's a half hybrid men and, and robots or whatever. Look at Ephesians chapter 6. Let's see here. That's page 1560. And we live in a day and age, 1560. We live in a day and age where we could read the Bible and see how these things are starting to fall into place. Back, back when Daniel, Daniel wrote that book, he didn't know what in the world he was talking about. He was foreseeing something in the future thousands of years, thousands or so, thousands of years, what, 2,000 at least. Yeah, 2,000 years, church age, into the future of, a, of people mingling themselves. Now, we, now we, we, we look around and judge things and see what's going on in the world and take it to this old Bible. And you can see how, how this Bible is coming to fruition. It's, it's fulfilling itself. Ephesians chapter 6, page 1560. Now look at this. Now look at verse 11. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Wiles, devil, he's trickery, he's treachery, tricking people. Verse 12. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities. There's one. Against powers. That's another one against the rollers of darkness of this world. There's another one. Against spiritual wickedness in high places. There's four classifications of, of uh, four classifications of, of, a, of a spiritual hierarchy, so to say. Like I said, the devil, the God, he got his hierarchy. Michael the Archangel, cherubim, seraphims. God's an orderly God. He got these things in order. The devil, a brief thing about them, you know, the closer you understand about God, you see that the devil, he always tries to mimic God. I mean, he always tries to, to be a counterfeit, facade, fake, phony, but he tries to mimic God. So he has his classifications of life. There's the hierarchy. Now I want to show you something. Look at Colossians chapter 2, verse 10. I got a blessing out of this one. Colossians chapter 2, verse 10. Colossians chapter 2. Let's look at verse number... Colossians chapter 2, verse number uh, verse number 8. We've got to start at verse number 8. That's page 1568. 1568. The book of Colossians. Now, Paul gives a warning here about something. Apostle Paul gives a warning. Col uh, Colossians chapter 2, verse 8. That's page 1568. Now, look at this verse number 8. Paul tells us to beware of something. Beware. Colossians 2.8, Beware, lest any man spoil you through philosophy. you got to watch out for philosophy. In vain deceit, after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. Somebody's going to spoil you. They're going to come by and, and think that, oh, it's so much better to just follow the world. It's so much better to just follow this certain philosophy. I studied philosophy in, in college. One of them was called hedonism. And all that told me is you could do whatever you want to do. <laughs> you do whatever you want to do. You want to you eat like a pig? You want to go around and, and commit all kinds of sexual, ungodly things? Go ahead and do it. And there's no boundaries. That's what philosophy will do to you. Paul says watch out for philosophy. All right, now look, at, and, look and not after Christ. Anything that doesn't train your mind 
and point the glory back to Jesus Christ, God Almighty, you got to be fishy about that. When I read books, when I read all this stuff, and I don't see one mention of the true God, they got this all these these weird names, the, the ether and the, the, the magnetic bond and the, the universal one and all these vague terminology. I want to know the, na the name of God is the name above all names, Jesus Christ. Now look at verse number 9. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power. You want to talk about the head of all principalities, powers, rulers of darkness, wickedness, devil, Satan, cherubim, seraphim, archangel. You go straight to the, the, throne, the, the man on the throne, Jesus Christ. Aren't you glad you can bypass the stars and go pray right directly to God? <laughs> you know, people make a wish on the, make a wish on the stars. What am I going to do that for? I could just go right to the throne of glory, right, right to my Lord and Savior. I don't go full around with no stars or nothing like that. that you know, the, the, I go right to the main guy. Jesus Christ makes intercession for me. So that that now that's one thing. Now, I'm gonna just we're gonna get into some brief stuff here. This might be a little wild, but <laughs> it might be a little wild. We gotta just go right on this now. So now. All right, all the information below can be found in just about any UFO book. All right, I recommend Dr. Ruckman's UFO book, Black is Beautiful. Great, I think that's a good book. But not only that, there's all kinds of UFOlogy. UFOlogy, what's that? Just the knowledge of UFOs. All kinds of books, tons of them. Now, you're getting about this, and there's, there are people, they're going to tell you that there's all these classifications of these extraterrestrials. All right, one of the classifications, this is your the, one of the classic ones they people think in Hollywood, you know, Hollywood don't make up stuff. Hollywood, they read. Hollywood, they read. They read philosophy books. They read these ex exoteric, here's one, some words you want to know, esoteric and exoteric knowledge. What's uh, esoteric is something that's only insiders know. This gets in all your symbolism, Freemasonry and all this weird symbolism that's all around the world and stuff. Witches and warlocks and all that, they operate by symbolism. That's esoteric. Exoteric, well, that's just the Pepsi sign. Oh, that's just the Facebook F. Oh, that's just the Gmail logo or whatever, you know. That's the exoteric. The outsiders look at it like that. But then there's an esoteric meaning, an inside, a secret, a hidden. This gets into Gnosticism, occultism, theosophy, New Age stuff, all these, these different things here. I don't know how I got off on that. Anyways, um, the greys. Gray-skinned, humanoid, usually three to four foot tall, hairless, large heads, black almond-shaped eyes, nostrils without a nose, slits for mouth, no ears, have three to four fingers, including a thumb. Three to four fingers. Well, I read about in the Bible, Og, king of Bashan, one of them giant, they had six fingers. That's some weird stuff. This guy, he had three to four fingers. Grays have been the predominant extraterrestrial beings of alleged alien contact since the 1960s. Man, you, you get studying into UFOlogy in the 1950s and 60s. My, not, not you, Grandma, but my other grandma. <laughs> my other grandma would swear she saw one of these things on Allegheny River Boulevard hovering. She always said hovering, hovering over top of this thing while they were on the pullover in the middle of the night. You wonder what they were doing. On the pullover, over on Allegheny River Boulevard, seeing this spaceship hovering over the water, quiet. She put down the windows. Carl, put down the windows. And she's seen this thing hovering over there. And, and, and that thing would go along the Allegheny River. And next thing you know, it just took off. It's, it's real slow. She said, follow it, follow it. My pap was scared to death to tell that story. <laughs> she told that story. She would draw it on napkins for me and stuff. But whatever. now this is back in the 50s, seeing these weird things, these UFOs and saucers and stuff. You imagine what they got now. Okay, so another one, they got these guys called the Tall Whites. Now, this, this is a mix between the Greys and the Nordics. Okay, the greys in, the, in this Nordic race. Now, who are these guys? Now, the Nordics. This is your common, they call it the Aryan race. All right, this is what they would call this, the, the blonde hair, blue eyes, the, the ultimate, you know, the best genes and stuff. Right away, you, you, if you know a thing or two about Adolf Hitler in Nazi Germany, you're going to find out Adolf Hitler was in search for these beings, these, this Aryan race, this pure race of people, okay? Now, with these guys, what do they say? Sometimes called space brothers, but I can't pleasure in as Pilates, uh, Palladians, from Pilates. 
Now, Lord willing, if we get to these verses, God has something to say with, with constellations. Read the book of Job. He talks about Pilates, Orion, Maz Mazdaroth, and Arcturus. Why? God talks about constellations. What a weird thing. You know, there may be some association with fallen angels and God giving a hint about where these angels, what constellation they're coming from. <laughs> tell you, that, that Bible is a deep book. And there's some things in there that, yeah, be simple concerning that which is evil. Be wise unto that which is good. But you got the heart to study and search out things. God will show you all kinds of stuff in that, in that Bible. Anyways, they say these guys come from Pilates, all right? Um, what else they say? Featured in several cases of contact, it's said that they are from ancient earth, but presenting themselves as ETs in the past. They moved from living on the surface to live underground. Now get this, around the Himalayas, Himalaya area after, after a natural event. So they've moved and fled underground after a natural event. Well, what, what, could, what natural event happened? <laughs> Flood of Noah, God flooded the entire planet. All right, now there's always speculation. I don't, know, got the, I don't got the answer for this one. Where in the world did them giants come from after the flood? We never read that. The, there's only four possibilities because it says they were in the earth after that. It's either the sons of God came back down and interbred. You got Goliath and you got the, his brothers and, his, and the other guy. Or they, they, they fled down into the, into the rocks or something like that. I don't know. But you're getting a lot of stuff about the world underneath of the heart of the earth, the underworld. Now, back in the day, back before the cross, all right, back before the cross, there was a place in the heart of the earth called hell. That's still there today, still burning hot as can be. There's no air conditioning in it. It's still hot. <laughs> okay, no water in it. It's still flaming fire and torment. Hell didn't change. It didn't just get ramped up in those couches and those nice towel floor and stuff because we're trying to keep up with the times or nothing. It's still burning. And then there was a place called Abraham's bosom. Abraham's bosom was a state of paradise. But we know after the cross, paradise got caught up to the, to the third heaven. I got to slow down a lot of this stuff. Probably like, psh, psh, psh. the third heaven. There's there's the heaven. There's the atmosphere. Then the second heaven is the uh, is outer space, and then the third heaven is where God, where God abide, uh, abides. I mean, if you just drop dead today and you believe in Jesus Christ, you go up to the third heaven. There's no intermediate state no more. That place got taken up. But it's interesting how they said they fled to the Himalayas. Now, let's see here. Um, all right, now, here's something that's worth reading. 1938, all right, you got a guy named uh, Heinrich Himmler, a leading member of German, Germany's Nazi party and key architect of the Holocaust, sent a five-member team to Tibet to search for the origins of the supposed Aryan race. Uh, author, whatever, recounts the fascinating story of this expedition, which passed through India. A little over a year before the World War II began, a group of Germans uh, landed along India's border. They were on a mission to discover the source of the Aryan race. Adolf Hitler believed that the Aryan Nordic people had entered India from the north some 1,500 years earlier and stuff and, and, and committed the crime of mixing with the local un-Aryan people, losing their attributes, um, and that made them racially superior to all their people. You hear about this. Well, the whole thing, Adolf Hitler, he's exterminating all the Jews and the, and the Jehovah's Witnesses and, and, the, and, the, and the, even the, uh, all kinds of groups of people that, were, that died in the Holocaust even in search for this race of people. Adolf Hitler was one of the highest, most religious occultists ever to live this on this planet. You know what he was too? He was a Roman Catholic. <laughs> he was a Roman Catholic, that guy. But that, uh, not only all, you know, he was, a, or he was baptized and shook hands with the Pope and made deals with the Pope and all that. So a lot of weird intermingling. With, with, I'd watch out for it. Look at the fruit of Catholicism. Adolf Hitler, Heinrich Himmler. Look at all the mobsters and mafia guys come from the Catholic Church. Bad fruit. I don't want nothing to do with that, with that system. Anyways, Adolf Hitler. All right. Um, verse nine, uh, or verse. In 1935, um, Himmler, he set up this whole thing, the Bureau of Ancestral Heritage. You look all this stuff up. But to find out people from Atlantis had gone. So he, they're looking for this whole city of Atlantis. Okay, We're going to get into this New Age stuff about theosophy. Now, what, this, what theosophy is, this term, it's a knowledge of God, theosophy. That's what the, Theos is God. Osophy is, an, is knowledge. It's the knowledge of God. And what this, what this whole branch of religion does is it picks and chooses 
things from other religions. Like, well, I'll take a little bit of Buddhism. I'll take a little bit of ancient Hinduism. I'll take a little bit of things from Muslim and Islam. I'll take a little bit of Christianity, and I'm going to conglomerate it into some pot, and that's the true religion. You can't have conflicting ideologies. You can't have conflicting absolute truths. That's a big deal. One, one, says, one says one thing that completely contradicts another thing. One thing's wrong. I mean, it's that simple. You can't have one. They all say something different. This is the danger of New Age theology. Because what New Age theology would tell you about our Lord and Savior is they say that Jesus Christ is no different than Mahatma Gandhi. He's no different than Buddha. He's no different than Prophet Muhammad. He's no different. What do you mean no different? They, what, what did those guys ever do for you? And they, they'll say this. They'll say, well, the Holy Spirit of God that came upon him at the baptism, the heavens opened. But when he died, he gave up the ghost. Next thing you know, the Holy Spirit went on to another guy. Then it went on to another guy. And then here's another thing the New Agers will say. Every, every person got a spark of divinity within them. You know, they all say that we're, you're all going to, you all have a little bit of gods in you. You know, you know who said that in the, in the book of Genesis chapter 3? You know what he got the, the ladies? You know, excuse me, but God, but the devil came right, attacked the lady first. He went directly to Eve because women are more susceptible to emotions and they fall for things and stuff like that. Guys are always observed for the facts. I need to see the facts of stuff, you know. God, the devil went right to Eve and said, you partake of this tree of knowledge of good and evil, ye shall be as gods. Ye shall be as gods. And that's the first, and now you get to this new age stuff where you see all these rolls and scrolls and TikToks or whatever they call them, and they see well, everybody got a spark of divinity. Everybody's a god and stuff. There's nothing new about that. That's what the, they're falling for what the devil tricked Eve with, with this whole thing of everybody's, everybody's gods and stuff. That's, that's not the case. You're made after the image of God and all that, but you're not, a, you're not miniature gods. Now, okay, another group of these things is reptilians. Now, this is, this is, these are some weird things. So the reptilians, or they call them reptilioids, sometimes spelled as reptilians, now also called draconians. Orion reptilian humanoid matriarchy. Orion. Now, okay, Orion. This is where these things want to come from. Now, let's look at the Bible. Let's get back to the Bible. Now, look at, let's look at some things about the constellations, okay? Let's try to tie this stuff all together. Like I said, the, the, the introduction to this is anything out there that's under the sun, God gave me a book by which I know what's true and what's false. He gave you an absolute standard. That's a loving God. That's the God of the universe. So there's no, air, there's no room for confusion. Look at, um, let's see here. Look at, uh, where do I want to go first? I want to go to Acts 14 first. I'm going to show you a real quick thing about planets. It's interesting how the Bible mentions two planets. Look at Acts chapter 14, page number page number 1454. I'll give you some time. I'll give you some time to collect our thoughts again. Acts chapter 14. Acts chapter 14. That's page number 14, what did I say, 57, 1457? I want verse, uh, Acts chapter 14, look at verse number 11. Okay, look at this, it's, it's an interesting story here. Acts chapter 14, verse 11. And when the people, all right, this is, this is Paul and uh, Paul's crew, I believe Barnabas is there, and um, they're going around preaching the gospel of the grace of God. Jesus Christ came down and died for the sins. That's good news. That's the type of good news I want to hear. God coming down, loving me, dying for my sins, and resurrecting the third day, preaching the gospel. They come into Asia. <laughs> they come into Asia to the heathen. Look at verse number 11. And when the people saw what Paul had done, they lifted up. They lifted up their voices, saying in the speech of Lys uh, uh, Lysonia. Now look what they said. The gods are come down to us in the likeness of men. <laughs> these bunch of pagans. The gods come down to us. Because Paul and Barnabas are doing these miraculous miracles, they called them gods. <laughs> Paul and Barnabas. Now, now look at verse 12. They called Barnabas Jupiter. Ain't that weird? And Paul Mercurius. Because he was the chief speaker. Now that's interesting. That Paul had a higher title. Now, we think of Jupiter right away is like the, that's the big planet, the biggest planet in our solar system, Jupiter, with the big eye on it and stuff. 
but they gave a higher they gave a higher name to Paul. They called him Mercurius. I don't know what the deal is up with Mercury. All right, but two planets in the Bible that are likened unto gods: Jupiter and Mercury. Okay, now look what look what he says there, in verse thirteen. Then the priest of Jupiter, which was before the city, brought oxen and garlands unto the gates, and would have done sacrifice with the people. Meaning they were they were going to lay down and worship Paul and Barnabas as, you know, I'm going to bring you food. I'm going to bring you garland. I'm going to treat you as like you were some god. Okay, now look, look what Paul says. Now, which when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard of, they rent their clothes and ran among the people crying out. <laughs> look what they said. Saying, sirs, why do you do these things? We also are men of like passions with you and preach unto you that you should turn from these vanities. Unto the living God. There's a good thing for repentance. Turn from the vanities unto the living God, which made heaven and earth and sea and all things therein. Paul and Barnabas were some humble men. Man. You know how many people would have would have took that worship and said, yeah, bring it on, you know. Come on, you might as well paint my feet and rub my feet and hoist me around town and stuff. But notice how Paul and Barnabas didn't do that. They rebuked them, said, you turn from these vanities. Now, two planets. Now come to uh, Acts 19 couple pages to the right. Look at, let's look at another one. Acts 19. Look at verse number. Acts 19.35. Another thing that's very interesting. Acts 19.35. 14.68. Acts 19.35. So it's, it's, I think it's fascinating to me that God mentions two planets. What, I don't know about Venus and Mars and you know all that. But there's some significance in our Bible, why God put these, these, these things in here. Number one, that's a negative context. If you want to know the thing about, well, is it good or is it bad? Well, that was false worship. So something, Jupiter, and something with Mercury, eh, I don't know. There's something, there's something off about them two planets. Look at Acts 19. Look at verse number 35. Acts 19, 35. And when the town clerk had appeased the people, he said, Ye men of Ephesus, what man is there that knoweth not how that the city of the Ephesians is a worshiper of the great goddess Diana? Okay, now look at this. They worship Diana and of the image which fell down from Jupiter. An image fell down from Jupiter. Number one, they worship they worship a, a woman. Now you get in the latter days in this 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 feminine spirit, this 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 that God that God is a woman in this this seduction and in the Bible says that, that stuff like that it draw it draws men away to lust, Jezebel and stuff like that. You get in that whole spirit. Um, but now this image fell down from where? Fell down from Jupiter. Now we know in the in the tribulation period there's going to be an image of the beast. I don't know what material that thing's made out of, but. There's something that's interesting there about that image falling down from Jupiter. Now, let's look at some constellations. Let's look at the book of Job. Look at the book of Job. That's page number, that's page number, uh, well, Job chapter 9. Job is one of, the, one of the most scientific books in the Bible. Absolutely blows my mind the things that, that you find. Job, matter of fact, is the most scientific book in the Bible, I would say, one of them. And it's the oldest book in the Bible, the book of Job. You can find a lot of good wisdom in the book of Job. Look at Job chapter 9. Now look at this. Job chapter 9, it's page 737. So we looked at a couple planets that were mentioned in the Bible. Mercury and Jupiter. Uh, Jupiter definitely has a negative connotation to it because they were worshiping an image that fell from it. And it reminds me of the Muslims that worshiped that black stone that fell from, uh, from a planet or whatever, they said, an asteroid or whatever, and they put it in Mecca, and they kissed this stone. What am I doing kissing a, what are you, what are you doing kissing a stone? And you, we got in this day and age where people, they got their, their lucky charms, their lucky stones, and this stone wards away this stuff. The demons are cracking up laughing because that's idolatry. You think that stone's going to, matter of fact, and uh, here's the wild stuff about it. People get big with this stones and this incense. Yeah, I'm going to light some sticks on fire, and I'm going to think that's going to ward away the bad negative energy and stuff. That's witchcraft. That's sorcery. That stuff, people are doing this. People my generation, people are falling for this stuff, these stones and things. 
Anytime you look at stones in the Bible, that's an association with idolatry. You want to ward away evil spirits, you go straight to God Almighty and you say, Lord God, Lord, rebuke thee, thou wicked and unclean spirit. <laughs> I don't want no dealing with stones and all this, this occult, this witchcraft type stuff. That's what it is when you get down to it. You, you compare it with the scriptures. Now, now, that, now listen. I don't say that to, not, to really knock people because I say it for a sense of comfort that I don't need to trust in materials. I trust in the living God. The God that, that you know, not, not these things that this, this matter, you know, that fades away and stuff. I, I trust in the, the living God that saved my soul. You know, no, I'll, I'll, so be careful with that. But look at Job chapter 9, verse 9, page 737. Now look what, look, look what the Lord says. Look at verse number 8 for context. Well, I'll come back to verse number 6 for context. Which shaketh the earth, Job chapter 9, verse 6, which shaketh the earth out of her place, and the pillars thereof trembleth, tremble, which commandeth the sun, and it riseth not, and sealeth up the stars, which alone spreadeth out the heavens. Notice that, heavens, plural. Heavens, and treadeth upon the waves of the sea. Now, Job's talking about God. Do you, do you know one person that tread that treadeth upon the waves of the sea? Jesus Christ. Treaded upon the waves in the middle of the night, walking upon the water. <laughs> Be not afraid, Peter. Now, who treadeth upon the who treadeth upon the waves of the sea? Now look at verse 9. Which maketh Arcturus, Orion, and Pilates, and the chambers of the south. Now that's weird. Now I look up a definition of chamber. It's an apartment in an upper story. An apartment in an upper story. There's three heavens, the atmosphere, outer space, and eternity. So there's a chamber, there's dwelling places in the upper chamber, chambers of the south. An apartment, the definition of chamber, an apartment in an upper story, a place where an assembly meets, a private or secret council to reside in. Now that has something to do with a chamber, which maketh Pilates, Orion, the chambers of the south, which do with great things past finding out and wonders. So just to, I want to draw to your attention Arcturus, Orion, Pilates. All right, now come to Job 38. Look at Job 38. You're in the same book of Job. Keep turning the page till you find Job 38. Job chapter 38. Now why in the world is God telling me that, now we know in association who treadeth upon the waters and stuff, that's Jesus. Then the right verse after that says, which maketh. We know that Jesus Christ is God, and God made these constellations. Now, this is, I think there's some, some things, some nuggets that we, could, that we can dig out of here. Look at Job chapter 38. Look at verse number 31. I'll come back to verse 30. Now, look at this. Let's see here. Look, look at Job chapter 38. Look at verse number 30. Okay, watch this. The waters are hid as with a stone. You say, what's that mean? I got no idea. The waters are hid as with a stone. Now, in the face of the deep is frozen. The face of the deep is frozen. Now, you do more further study on this deep. We're in Job chapter 38, verse 30. Um, not to get too far in this, but the sea, there's, a, the, there's a sea of glass before the throne of God. Before you get into eternity, there's a sea of glass there, and that thing's frozen. We live in a universe that's bound by time, space, and matter. We live in a closed system, okay? And I don't care how vacuum sealed you, eventually that thing's going to rot and wear out. Same thing with us. <laughs> Same thing with this whole universe. It's going to rot and wear out. But when you get outside that closed system, that's where God is. That's eternity. That's the streets of gold and all that. Okay, that's, that's eternity. But in this closed system, the boundaries of this universe, God got that thing frozen off, okay? That's how. That's what I believe about that. About that passage. I don't know. I don't know about the whole thing about the flat Earth and that's the walls of Antarctica and stuff. I, I'm, I don't look at it like that. Now, real quick, let me just throw out here for a minute. I believe you know that when I'm gonna get up here, I get raptured up. I'm gonna see the, the shape of the world and all that stuff. But listen, when I think when I see that flat Earth model, I think of something little. You know, the sun's floating around in a snow globe, and you know everything's all tiny, like right here and stuff. It don't bug me a bit to think about the expansiveness 
of, that's the power of God. If he wanted to make heaven 50 trillion zillion light years across, <laughs> hey, that's fine by me. That's just, that manifests his power and glory. But the whole thing about that, well, you know, they, they want to just make you feel small and unworthy. I am small and unworthy, but God came down and loved me and died for my sins. <laughs> you know, I don't care if I'm just a little speck in the, you know, they blow up this thing and you're just over here and stuff. Still shows you how much God loves you. Okay, regardless of whatever shape you think the world is. Now look at verse 31, though. Verse 31. Canst thou bind the sweet influences of Pilates? Sweet influences of Pilates. That's, now, that's weird. Now, Pilates, that's a cluster of stars in the constellation Taurus. They say 440 light years from the solar system. And that word means to sail. Now you get into mythology and all that. Pilates were the seven daughters of Titan and all this stuff. And something happened in that constellation with, from, uh, from, uh, from people that were in the Orion constellation. Okay, this is, this is off. You can take it or leave it. And they did something to this constellation to Pilates. Okay, but it's interesting. You take it, whatever, how you read that. Canst thou bind the sweet influences of Pilates? How many of you would say that's positive or negative? I look at that as something positive. Sweet influences? I could be wrong. I don't know. But, or loose the bands of Orion. Now, when you study the word bands in the Bible, you know what that has to do with? It has to do with numbers of men. It has to do with army. It has to do with troops. A band, of a, a, a band of men came and stole the Lord and stuff like that. Bands. Now, this, and this, this would, go, would coincide with a lot of this mythology stuff about how there's, there's wicked people... <laughs> I don't know, whatever that thing is, reptilians, from that constellation of Orion. I don't know. You could, you could take it or leave it, but loose the bands of Orion. Now look at verse 32. Canst thou bring forth Maseroth in his season? All right, Maseroth, what's he? A garland of crowns. In Hebrew, it also means constellations, okay? Um, so Maseroth, something, a garland of crowns is what that word means. Or canst thou guide um, Arcturus? I guess I didn't get what that Arcturus was. Uh, I, if I recall, it's something with an archer or something. Arcturus. Now look at this. With his sons. Arcturus got sons. Now this is wild stuff. You know, I don't want to claim to figure this all out, but hold on now. We know that we know that there's, there's beings called the what? The sons of God. We know that, that angels have habitations. They got chambers, they got estates somewhere out in the, in the second heaven. And right here, Arcturus with his sons, I'm probably people dwelling over in, in the constellation of Arcturus. Now look at verse 33. Knowest thou the ordinances of heaven? Canst thou set the dominion thereof on earth? Now God's talking rhetorically. Do you know the ordinances of heaven? Now you look up that word ordinance, what's it has to do with? Laws. How things operate. So there's certainly, there's ordinances down here on planet Earth. God got some type of ordinances up there in, um, in the second heaven, up in outer space. Now, I want to look at one about, while we're in the book of Job, come to Job 25, verse 5. I'm going to show you something about stars. Look at Job 25, verse 5. A couple chapters to the left. Job 25. Job 25, let's see, verse number... Job 25, verse number, um, man, I got the wrong one, got the wrong, wrong text here. Um, anyways, here's a good one. Look at Job 25, verse number, uh, verse number seven. He stretcheth out the north over the empty place and hangeth the earth upon nothing. Hangeth the earth upon nothing. Well, that's pretty scientific, wouldn't you say? This earth, this earth is just floating here. Anyways, look, hold on. Stars are unpure. I got to I gotta get a reference here real quick. Yeah, where am I at? Job 25, verse... The stars are not clean in his sight? Yeah, where, where am I at here? Help me out. Oh, I was at 26. I, that's a, this is a short chapter, man. Job 25, yeah. Job 25, verse number 5. My eyes were looking on the other side of the page here. Look at Job 25, verse number 5 here. Okay, we're talking about these stars. Behold, even to the moon, and it shineth not. 
Yea, the stars are not pure in his sight. There's something wrong with the stars? Now, if we hold this, well, the, the, the stars, they're just gas and nebula and chemical compounds. and Well, okay, there might be an application with that and all. But here, the stars are not pure in his sight. Come to the book of Revelation chapter 12. Let's try to tie this stuff all together here. Look at Revelation chapter 12. Revelation chapter 12. It's page number, page number 1657. Page 1567, or 1657. Look at this. Look at uh, Revelation chapter 12. Now God said that the stars are unclean in his sight, or, or not pure in his sight. Now, Revelation chapter 12, look at verse number, let's see here, look at verse number 7, Revelation 12, 7. Okay, and there was a war in heaven, Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels, and prevailed not, neither was their place found any more in heaven. This is a future event. This is prophecy. People think they, they take this verse and ascribe it way back to over here, but this is the book of Revelation. This is something that's yet to happen in the future, the revelation of Jesus Christ, okay? Now, come down to verse number 10. Well, finish that verse. Verse 9, And the great dragon was cast out, the old serpent, called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Next thing you know, I want that verse where it says about um, he cast out the uh, stars. Um, and I'm messing up on this reference too. Something about stars. Where is that at here? Um, here, same chapter, 12, verse 4. 12, verse 4. Look at this. Flip a page beforehand. Because I want to show you the association with these angels in the Bible are also sometimes called or referenced to as stars. Look at Revelation 12. Look at verse number 4. And his tail, talking about the devil, his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven and did cast them to the earth. Now you can clearly see that that's not talking about balls of nebulous gas and stuff or else it would swallow up earth. So them stars of heaven cast them to the earth. Now, some speculation from looking at some of the things that we've seen. You know, take it or leave it. Could it be possible that those stars that fall from earth are from the constellation of Orion? I don't know. You know, I mean, this is the type of stuff that, you know, I don't know. I, I find this type of stuff interesting. You know, I love the Bible. I love the things of God. Maybe seeing any type of little connection and stuff like that is like, wow, you know, what? You know, I don't know how it's going to make you have a better day at work tomorrow or nothing like that, but hey, you know, it might, it might, show, you, it might show you something. It might show you the, the treasures that you can find, the deep things in God's book. Sometimes that's, you know, that's all I can do. I may not, you know, may not be able to run around and shout, you know, hallelujah, praise the Lord and all that, but I think there's some interesting stuff with this. Look at the look at book of Revelation chapter 9 because it's wild, though. You know, people get more stirred up about reading their astrology signs and lighting their candles and playing with their Ouija boards and stuff than they do to actually, let me see some truth about these constellations and these reptilian books and all that. Let me see some truth about this stuff, you know? Look at, look at, look at Revelation chapter 9. Check, check out verse number 1. Look at Revelation chapter 9, verse 1. The fifth angel sounded, and look what happened. Re Revelation chapter 9, verse 1. And I saw a star fall from heaven, unto the earth and to him was given the key to the bottomless pit this star fell from heaven remember what we read in job the stars are not pure in his sight this is one of the the, the, the two-thirds of the stars are, are falling these are this that's a, that star right there is a fallen angel <laughs> now look what he did he opened up the bottomless pit and smoke arose now and then you come to verse number uh <laughs> you want to talk about Oh, geez. Look at verse number three. There came out a smoke locusts upon the earth. Now, these ain't just no normal locusts. You keep reading. Unto them was given power, 
as the scorpions of the earth have power. It was commanded them that they do not hurt the grass or the earth. Well, if that's a normal lo locust, every locust out there chews up trees and crops and destroys crops. But something's weird about this. Look at this. Neither any green thing, neither any tree, but only those men which have not the seal of God in their foreheads. These are mutants attacking mankind. Now look at this. And to them, it was given that they should not kill them, but that they should be tormented five months. Their torment was as the torment of a scorpion when it striketh a man. Now look at the, look at verse number seven. What, what are these locusts? This, this, this falls onto another groups of beings in the Bible. And these are located in the bottomless pit and underneath the crust of the earth. Okay, look at verse 7. And the shapes of the locusts were like unto horses prepared unto battle. That's a big, big locust. <laughs> and on their heads were, as it were, crowns like gold. They got crowns. And their faces were as the face of men. And they had hair as the hair of women. And their teeth were as the teeth of lions. Those ain't no bugs. And they had breastplates as it were breastplates of iron. And the sound of their wings was as the sound of chariots of many horses. They had tails. Now look at verse 11. They had a king over them. Here's another, here's another being. Which is the angel of the bottomless pit whose name in the Hebrew tongue is Abaddon. In the Greek tongue, his name is Apollyon. Ain't that interesting? You know what those words mean, Apollyon and Abaddon? Pretty much destruction. And that, you know what that verse is? This is Revelation chapter 9. 11, 9-11, you think of that, what happened on 9-11? A lot of destruction. Who do you think was summoned on that day? The devil. I don't care how them towers fell down, the devil was involved, okay? Many people say that that tower, all that stuff, that was a burnt, burnt offering to the devil, 9-11. That's scary stuff. To usher in them two towers, next thing you know, they built one of them. Oh, I, uh, I mean, no, no, no harm. They took and they, they, then they, they turned them two towers and they combined them into one tower. That's like a, that's like a mixture of well, unity. We're coming, we're getting back to the, like almost like the Tower of Babel. Now it's a whole other thing. But Revelation nine eleven, you got, you got. Look at those beings that were that were involved in there. So there's that's a, there's a that's a baton, that's a polyon, that's a star came down and, and, and fell down in the bottomless pit. Now I want to look at I'm gonna maybe close here. We gotta wrap things up. Let's close with uh, let's look at some uh, let's look at Zechariah five. We we can't we can't forget this one. Zechariah chapter five. That's page number. I mean it goes on and on. You ain't gonna get this in in one one session here. No way. Look at Zechariah chapter five. Zechariah chapter 5. Look at this. That's page 1216. Now, this is definitely a UFO, an unidentified flying object. In Zechariah chapter 5, page 1216. Look at this. Now, we're going to see some connotations, some, some context here with what these UFOs are. Now I'm gonna just jump ahead. I'm gonna just spit off some stuff. You could you could listen if you'd like or whatever. But when I see the words chariots in the Bible, I know you know what's interesting? God comes back on a white horse. When I see chariots in the Bible, now always remember that God there's always counterfeits with God and the devil. If God comes back on a on a white horse, what well, in that could explain why with them now I, I was laying on bed thinking this. I look I didn't have no nightmares, thinking God. Who created, who, you didn't make those things in the bottomless pit. Mutant, hybrid. Now it gets into, oh, you know what the Nazis were doing down there over there in Antarctica or whatever? <laughs> they were down there genet genetically mutating beasts with mankind. I believe that. Now, you can look at me like a crazy nut or whatever. But them Nazis were down there doing something. And they got videos of the stuff. I don't recommend you looking it up. Some of the weird scientist pictures and stuff, they're trying to hybridize people. Somehow, some way, the devil is creating mutant hybrids down in the heart of the earth. God comes back on white horses. The devil comes back with some mutant, ugly-looking things. Okay, God, you know, God talked. God got you know chariots. Elijah got caught up in what? A chariot of fire, a, or what was it? A whirlwind or a chariot of fire came up. And there's another passage in the Old Testament. Elisha, 
He's looking up in the mountains and said, God, open up my eyes. God opened up his eyes. He's seen chariots of fire round about. If only God would take off the veil of our physical eyes and we've seen it in the spiritual realm. <laughs> well, I don't want to see no spiritual. I'd, be, I'd fall back. I don't want to see all that. that stuff would scare the death out of me. But he's seen chariots of fire. I believe those are a good thing. That, 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 that was a good connotation. So the devil is going to have his chariots. Now, you want some good picture? You want to make the Old Testament some fun reading? You look at the book of Exodus, and you think about when Pharaoh, what's Pharaoh, a type of antichrist? Pharaoh's chasing God's people, and he got chariots on the back, okay? And you know that those spiritual chariots, and God overswelled the waters and destroyed all them chariots. Um, them chariots, you could look up something. There's, maybe the devil got his chariots that are, I don't know, saucer-shaped. Roll shaped. Uh, the Bible says Sisera. Sisera was another type of antichrist. Got a stake stuck right in his temples. Sisera. He had chariots of iron. Okay, chariots of iron. Now, this may be a little off. You could take it or leave it. This is for some people. This, ain't, this saying ain't for all people. <laughs> but whoever gets it, gets it. But um, so Sisera he had chariots of iron. God told Solomon and David, don't you go down to Egypt and get horses. Okay, it's a pretty wild, you know, wild commandment or something. Now, the point I'm making is there may be some spiritual chariots that God got, no doubt about it, but there may be some counterfeit chariots that the devil got. And that may picture Pharaoh's chariots and Sisera's chariots. There may be an association with chariots with unidentified flying. God got flying chariots, and the devil's going to counterfeit it. He'll make something. Now, look at Zechariah chapter 5, verse number 1. Then I turned and lifted up my eyes and looked, behold, a flying roll. He said unto me, What seest thou? And I answered, I see a flying roll. The length thereof is 20 cubits. Ain't that pretty plain? The length thereof 20 cubits. That's 30 foot. The breadth thereof 10 cubits. That's 15 foot wide. 30 foot by 15 foot wide. Now look at this. Then he said unto me, This is the curse that goeth forth over the face of the whole earth. That's horrible, whatever that flying roll is. A flying roll, the curse, it's a curse of the whole earth. What is that? For everyone that stealeth shall be cut off as every side according to it, and everyone that sweareth shall be cut off as the side according to it. I will bring it forth, saith the Lord of hosts, and it shall enter into the house of the thief, and into the house of him that sweareth falsely by my name. It shall remain in the midst of his house, this curse. It shall consume it, with the timber thereof and the stones thereof. Imagine if a flying roll came in your house and burnt that thing down to a crisp. <laughs> it's going gonna, it's gonna to consume the timber and the stones, this roll that goes off in their house. Notice how God uses that thing for judgment, though, to, to come into the thief's house. Look at verse 5. The angel that talked with me went forth and said unto me, Lift up now thy eyes and see what is this that goeth forth. And look at verse 6. And I said, what is it? He said, this is an ephah that goeth forth. He said, moreover, this is their resemblance through all the earth. Now let's pause. Let's look at an ephah. That's an ephah. It's a bowl shape. <laughs> Let me just put a little cap on it and make it look a little cooler and put some windows on it. Now you can really tell what it is. An ephah. And what's that? Look like it looks like my look like a Noah's Ark type thing, but it's a it's like a bowl shape, okay. That's what the the Jews collected their food in an ephah, okay. In, in, but look what he said. This is their resemblance through all the earth. So there's things that resemble this thing throughout all the earth. Verse seven, and behold, there was lifted up a talent of lead. That thing got power to manipulate gravity somehow. Anti gravity technology. Think about that. This is and look at this now. And this is a woman that sitteth in the midst of, an, of the ephah. And he said, this is absolutely fantastic and wonderful. That's not what he said. This is wickedness. And he cast it in the midst of the ephah. He cast away the lead there upon the mouth. And next thing you know, and I lifted up my eyes, and behold, there came out two women. And the wind was in their wings. For they had wings like the wings of a stork. And they lifted up the ephah between the earth and heaven. That thing floated, anti-gravity type stuff. Verse 10. And said I to the angel 
that talked with me, whither do these bear the ephah? Meaning, what in the world is going on here? Where are they going with this stuff? Verse 11. And he said unto me, to build it a house in the land of Shinar, and it shall be established and set there upon her own base. Shinar. Where's that at? Babylon. Who do we believe Babylon is? Book of Revelation chapter 17. <laughs> the Vatican City. You read the book of you read the book of Revelation, the purple and gold, the precious stones and silver and all this coverings and all that. That is the devil. Uh, that is the that I mean <laughs> that is the Vatican City. Somehow, some way, these things build a base over in the land of Shinar. They got a base. Okay. I don't got all that thing, all that stuff figured out, but some of that is pretty clear to me. Okay. Um, then now I'm going to close with one. I'm going to close here with First Thessalonians four. The last thing I'm going to talk about is God's IFOs. God's IFOs. You know what that means? God's identified flying objects. Can you guess who they're going to be? <laughs> they're going to be us. <laughs> Praise the Lord. God's identified flying objects. Look, let's check this out. Look at First Thessalonians chapter four. With all that wild, wild stuff here this this evening. We're going to close with a bit of words of comfort. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. I love this passage. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. I didn't get into the whole stuff. I'm going to have to... I'm going to skip over... Um, I'm going to skip over... Uh, I didn't even get into the bit of the theosophy. The Lord didn't want to talk about that. Let's see here. Um, they didn't get. They didn't talk about clouds in outer space. God's association with clouds. We'll pause here. God's association, while you're, while you're finding 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, hear me out. God's association with clouds. He cometh with clouds, right? Behold, he caught, when Jesus Christ ascended back up into heaven, he went with clouds. Okay, then now there's some association with clouds and God. There's clouds down here in the atmosphere. There's nebulous clouds up there in outer space. And I don't know, there may be some clouds around the throne of, of God too, okay? I don't know, you know, I don't know if there's ever a cloudy day around the throne or something, but... I don't know, okay, but God has some association with clouds. So therefore, the devil must have some association with clouds. And there's some weird, wacky stuff there out on the Internet. You could look up some clouds, okay? <laughs> Your head could get caught way up in the clouds. You get too far into all this stuff. But them, them clouds, they talk about. Now, this gets in the whole stuff of Project Blue Beam. This gets in the stuff of holographs. This gets into holographic stuff. You know, they're going to do a mock second coming um the devil always got counterparts there's some there's some wild stuff out there but uh, there's a whole thing i'll have to do that study for another day about clouds it's interesting but i know one thing i know that the, i get caught up to the clouds look at first look at first thessalonians chapter 4 look at verse 13 now look at this first thessalonians 4 13 page 1574 i'm gonna close with something that is, is very, very big because all this stuff that we just talked about, you know, these reptilians and these, these cyborgs and these uh, greys and all this weird stuff, you know, you think about it, all those things, there's no hope in those things. I don't care if they're, they, they call them the Nordics. Look, and I don't even care if them Nordics are, are angels or whatever, what, you know, whatever you want to call them. Those, those angels never done nothing for me either, really. People say guardian angel. I got a guardian God. His name is Lord Jesus Christ. I got the God of the universe. I don't need these other beings. There's no hope in those things. Look at, look at 1 Thessalonians 4.13. Paul says, I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. Now there's going to be a group, we which are alive and remain. Okay, look at verse 16. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Every grave, every grave out there is going to explode one day. Everybody that believed in Jesus Christ, that's the prerequisite to go at this event. Then we, 
Look at verse 17. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds <laughs> to meet the Lord in the air. So shall we ever be with the Lord. Now look at verse 18. Wherefore comfort one another with these words. Now in, in, in you come down to verse number chapter 5, the same chapter. Look at verse 3. When they shall say, peace and safety, peace, there's going to be peace, world peace. We beat COVID. We got, the, we got the new economic plan. We got the new deals, you know. Peace is coming, peace. Everybody's going to be rich. No more, no more nothing. This peace talk, you judge it. If, if, it ain't, if it don't got the Lord in it, that's a false peace. Look at this. For when they shall say, peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child. They shall not escape. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness that, that they should overtake you as a thief. <laughs> but I'm going to escape. <laughs> Why am I going to escape? Because I believe in Jesus Christ. He died for my sins. Rose again the third day. So the whole point of all this is one day God's going to catch away his people that are going to escape this time of wrath that God's going to pour out on planet Earth. You know, this, and now it gets into some... Uh, some things I'm just going to throw out there about the rapture. When people vanish, all the Christians vanish, what do you think the media is going to propagate it as? They're going to propagate it as some big alien abduction or something, and they took, a, they took us off to some planet or whatever. Um, Jesus Christ says something interesting. I, don't, I wonder, want you guys to study your Bible. I want you guys to chew on this for a little bit. What if the devil has a counterfeit rapture? Why did Jesus Christ say, you, you, you hear false prophets and false messiahs coming? Don't you go out into the desert. Don't go out in the secret chambers. Could be some speculation, but what if there's a false rapture? The devil catches away, and it, it would be, you know when we when we get caught away, you know where we go. We go to the you know judgment seat of Christ. We come back down. We have our marriage supper of the Lamb. Wouldn't it be something if the devil had a false marriage supper, and he went into the feast of the beast, and he catches up these people, and goes and feasts on their flesh or something like that? This is all just speculation. I'm just kind of just throwing it out there. But uh, you know there's always, there's, there's a, we live in a, a, what about a mock virgin birth? The devil's going to counterfeit the virgin birth and, and, you know, probably, you know, slow, have like a hybridized being or something like that. Um, how about, a, I just looked at this one. Uh, holographic stuff. What about if there was a mock holographic New Jerusalem descend, descending from the sky and stuff like that? They got power and technology to do all that. You know, the devil's always trying to counterfeit, but if I want to end it on something, you gotta, I got to end it on, you know, the gospel, which is the gospel, the grace of God is that Jesus Christ came down and died for our sins. He was buried and rose again the third day. Now, when you get into your prayer life, you know, I like that passage in Romans chapter 10, you know, people heard of the gospel before. Most, pe most people heard that, you know, what Jesus Christ did for them, but they never applied it to themselves. They might have heard it. They might have believed it. Romans chapter 10 says, um, you know, if you believe in the heart that God hath raised him from the dead, you know, with, with the heart man believeth unto righteousness and with the mouth confessions made to salvation, then you got to talk to God. You got to tell him, Lord, you know, I believe what you've done for me. I understand that I'm a sinner. I can't make my way to heaven aside from what you did for me. And you got to develop a personal relationship with God. Not a personal relationship with all these. <laughs> I don't want no personal relationship with him. I don't want no personal relationship with him. I don't want no personal relationship with none of these people. I want a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, the God that created all things. So that's what I, I urge you know everybody to to get in, into get in this Bible. Come come to Bible study. That's the whole point. You know you could you could dig out a lot of treasures and get a lot of understanding and wisdom and. In all facets of life, it's just not just the deep things, but a lot of wisdom is found in this book. So let's just bow our heads for closing prayer, and we'll, we'll get out of here. All right, dear Lord God, Heavenly Father, Lord, I just want to thank you tonight for your for your word, Lord, for this study. Um, might not have been a blessing to anybody else here, Lord, but it was a blessing to me because I love, I love you, dear God. I love your word. Uh, I just find it fascinating, dear Lord. You know, people talk about all this entertainment and ways that they spend their time lord i pray that we get get in your book draw us closer to you lord help us be heavenly minded and um dear god i just just pray for all those people that are deceived 
and uh, help us be witnesses to to show them to your truth, show them to your word, and to give us wisdom and understanding while while we uh, while we seek through um, all these things in your book, Lord. May I just may you receive all the praise and glory here tonight in Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. All righty, went a little long here tonight, but I wanted to just get that all out the way because you know there's still uh, it's a relevant topic though. It's a relevant topic.